What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Kirsten Potenza, CEO and founder of Pound the Rockout Workout. You're listening to The Big Green Couch, where I sit down with noisemakers across various industries to discuss different topics, to bring new ideas, fresh perspectives, and practical tips to you, our community. Let's get started. What's up, Pound Posse? Welcome to this episode of The Big Green Couch. Today, I have a very special guest. Uh, Paul Katami is a friend and somebody who I have known for over a decade. He was a large part of bringing Pound to life in the beginning stages, and I'm so excited to share his story and his journey with you all today. Paul has worked in the fitness industry for over two decades and has brought his health and wellness message globally by working with mega brands like Beachbody, Equinox, Crunch, and more. Paul has starred in multiple home programs and contributed to numerous television programs and publications with his cutting edge fitness methods. In addition to fitness, Paul loaned his voice to actively fight for the equal rights of the LGBTQ plus community when he and his now husband, Jeff, became named plaintiffs in the landmark federal case for marriage equality. This case made its way to the Supreme Court in 2013 and restored marriage rights for their community in California. Welcome to a very virtual uh, episode of The Big Green Couch. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. What a what a nice surprise to be able to connect <laughs> this way in these days, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And um, it's so funny. I was driving by the coffee shop um, yesterday uh, where, and I can't even remember, I think it was Bolt, where I saw you last. And Jeremy was like, oh, isn't that the person that you're talking to yesterday? Didn't we see him there? I was like, yeah, that was the last time that I saw you, which was Oh God, probably a year or two ago. Um, but Has it been that long? Wow. I okay. think so. Okay. I think so. <laughs> I, w- I will trust your memory on it because my memory is terrible. <laughs> Mine is pretty bad too. Um, I'm usually like, yeah, the other day it was like four years ago. Um, <laughs> Same. You and I go way, way back, which is where um, I want to start today and just share with our community. You are one of the reasons why pound got off the ground. Um, I remember vividly meeting you for the first time um, in Equinox. I think we walked in and we were asking for you and you came down and were so kind um, and welcoming. And we had a meeting, I think, on the second floor in your office. Like I remember it like it was yesterday. And I remember that world being so intimidating for me Um, and the the Equinox in West Hollywood is like such a epic gym and just walking in and knowing nothing about the industry, just having someone as kind and welcoming as you was pretty amazing and you played a really big role in kind of believing in us in the in the very beginning and helped. Um, you helped a lot in bringing in the program there, which I will appreciate until the end of my day. So thank you for that. You know, it's so, I, I, and thank you for even bringing that up and saying that, you know, it's, it's, I, I believe that in the career, in my career of fitness, that it's about that as well, because people did the same to me. People believed in me. They helped me, you know, along my way. And I have that entrepreneurial spirit as well. So when I see that in others and recognize that, it's something special, then it was just a matter of kind of continuing that kind of energy and support and connectivity that we have in our fitness world. I mean, it's all about like just making sure we all together bring the best fitness to other people's lives because that's really the goal. Um, So I appreciate you saying that because I do remember meeting you guys and Mm -hmm. saying, you know, like this is, it was such a, like a fun thing to remember and go back to that memory about like, you know, this is what we do. Like, this is what we do and how we do it in our community. And because of that, if we're kind and open and we listen and engage and recognize talent, um, what we're doing then is giving the world kind of the opportunity to get fit in fun ways and meet cool people and do great things. So y'all, I did, I really had nothing to do with it except for recognizing you guys did all the work. <laughs> I think my perception of the fitness industry, um, and I'm not afraid to say it today, was 
was, wasn't always so welcoming. I didn't always feel comfortable. And it was people like yourself and, and another, like there's probably a handful of people I can point out mm-hmm. um, in that beginning journey that just changed my view on what it could feel like and look like and what the experience could be like. So um, definitely a special time. And we'll definitely touch on your fitness career. But before we do, because I don't know this part of you, I want to talk about your your childhood, your upbringing. Where are you from? Um, I know that that question is like, you know, you could spend probably days telling me about it. But just um, because I don't know, I'd love to know a little bit more. Uh, for sure. So I, it's always weird for me to talk about myself. I don't know why I'm always like, oh, okay, here we go. So I'll keep it short. Um, I was born and raised in San Francisco. I am uh, the youngest of three by almost eight years. And my parents were immigrants. Uh, my dad is Jordanian. He uh, moved to Brazil when he was a teenager because he wanted to kind of start a new life and have more freedoms met my mom there. They got married and moved to the U.S. Um, I think 1963 or 1964, I think it was. So they landed in San Francisco and I feel incredibly lucky to have grown up there. Um, but I came from, you know, a family that was all about, we, we, we dealt with everything through food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's either food or fighting, one of the two. Oh, and, sounds like uh, Italians. <laughs> yeah, it was very like passionate and intense, but, um, based on that, like, I mean, I was just was a heavy kid, like it was a super heavy kid, but growing up in San Francisco was amazing. The diversity and inclusivity was great, even though, um, you know, I was closeted most of my life growing up there because it was still stigmatized and, you know, you still didn't have a lot of kind of, I guess, in the, at that time, like respect to rights in terms of our community. So what was interesting is like, you know, dealing with all of that and kind of like living in a place where we should have been incredibly comfortable, but still not. And, you know, religious household and family that was like super intense. Um, you know, I was a heavy kid growing up. So San Francisco was transformative, was amazing. But my family and all those things, you know, I just kind of ended up like thinking to myself at some point that I needed change. And one change was physical, which brought me to the fitness world. And the other was kind of more emotional and kind of connected freedom in terms of authenticity and truth. And that was more about kind of like just coming out and uh, being a little more uh, truthful in my life on all levels. How's that for being succinct? <laughs> That's amazing. I I know I was like, D- that was a really good um, short version and, and you ca- you captured and covered a lot. It's so interesting. I went to or I lived in San Francisco for only four years when I was in when I was in high school and the city to me, um, I moved from a very tiny, tiny little town in upstate New York where there was zero diversity. So moving to San Francisco and experiencing culture, honestly, for the first time in my life, I feel like it's such, such a special city to grow up in. Mm. Um, and there's so much history there, but still, you know, as you said, that comfortability of, of coming out and at that young age, it still wasn't what it is today, right? Correct. Correct. Um, and you're right. I mean, this, I mean, just talking about San Francisco just brings me back in such a big way because, again, even in a city that was a beacon for diversity and, you know, whatever, like people still live there and don't feel that because of their own circumstances. Uh, and so moving to a place like that must be amazing culture shock in a way, but there's still a a, a learning curve there. And, you know, some people feel immediately at home and some people kind of gradually feel like the city is teaching them that diversity, inclusivity, and like just how different, um, you know, all different types of communities can come together because it really is a small footprint with such a diverse and intense population. So um, in retrospect, I miss it. I would move back if I could take the if I could take the weather from like Los Angeles <laughs> <laughs> and move it into San Francisco, I would be there right now for sure. Um, so yeah, I think it's cool. It's a cool city. I 100% agree with you on that one. Um, I think you touched on this a bit, but in, in your bio, it says you began your your professional fitness career at the age of 19. And, you know, I've learned over the last 10 years um, through many conversations and honestly through my own experience that a lot goes into the decision 
uh, to start a career in fitness. Can you share a little bit more about that in your own personal experiences? About starting in fitness? <laughs> yeah. Like what was the, I mean, I think some people fall into it, but I think other people, there's certain things that motivate them, whether it's changing people's lives or changing their own. What was kind of the catalyst to you starting at such a young age too? This is a good question. And it's kind of a funny story, to be honest with you. So I was a heavy set kid. Like, so I went to college. I remember the day after I turned 18, I actually left for college. And it is one of the last kind of remaining photographs that I will show people like, okay, well, that's what I look like. And people are like, that's not you. I'm like, oh, that's me. Um, and I was heavy, like, and I got to college and I was recognizing that, you know, I was athletic. I played, you know, sports in high school and I was like interested in being healthy and fit while I was in college. But I realized very quickly that compared to many others, I wasn't like, I just didn't look the same, like the way I wanted to look. I didn't like feel the way I thought I wanted to feel, even though I was kind of striving for fitness. And believe it or not, I lived across the street from our sports and athletic center and they started to um, offer step aerobics classes at like six o'clock in the morning. And because I could like roll out of bed and like literally be there in three minutes, I was like, okay, let me go do this. And I was intimidated by the gym floor for sure. Cause it was just a bunch of like, you know, you know, rusted iron at, and or by the way, the, the gym now, if I go back to my college is like gorgeous and state of the art. But back then it was like, you know, you could get an infection by picking up a weight type of thing. <laughs> so it was just like, you know, a grungy, like cage filled with like rusted iron and a bunch of guys throwing stuff around. So I was intimidated by that, to be honest with you. I think like a lot of people where I was like, I can't really go in there and do that because I don't know what I'm doing. And so this is easy. I could go into a group fitness class that's mm. you know built to music. I loved music. I'm very rhythmic. I mean, I have a problem to living my life on the eight count. It's just weird. If I walk into a store and a song is playing, people would be like, why are you walking to the eight count? I'm like, ah, it's just how it happens in my life. So <laughs> I, I kind of fell in love with step aerobics and it was also helping me lose weight. So like that car, that steady state kind of cardio hour long, cool stuff to music. I was like, this is really cool. So gradually I went from the back of the room to the front of the room and got to know the instructor. And one morning, she just didn't show up and the rest of the class kind of looked at me and like, well, you've been up there for whatever, however many weeks or a couple months. And like, why don't you do this? And I was like, well, uh, I don't. And you know, lo and behold, like I ran across the street, I'm going to age myself by saying this, but I grabbed a cassette tape <laughs> of music <laughs> and I ran back and threw it in the boom box. Also aging myself right there. Um, and, I taught my very first class with zero training. Like it was just like, go. And it's funny because kind of like as a metaphor for life, I'm like, I'm usually not that guy to put myself out there like that without really knowing what I'm doing. Because if I want to do something, especially if other people are going to see it, um, I really want to like make sure it's the best I can possibly do at that time. Mm -hmm. So I don't, so I don't fail, but I just did it. And it was one of those moments where I was like, wow, that's really cool. That was really fun. And people were like, that was really awesome. You should do this. And because I stepped in and did it, that was my first job. Like initially they were like, can you, do you want to add a class? And so now rather than just two classes a week, there were four and I had two and I just, I fell into it. So then that's when I got certified as a group fitness instructor and for step aerobics and you know, primarily, and it started my fitness career. And I just was, and it wasn't even a fitness career. It was more like I'll do this because I can make a couple bucks and I would do it anyways and it's fun, but I never mm -hmm. thought of it as like a career path. Like I didn't think the arc would take me into that career for good. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting story because I kind of, like you said, people fall into it. I fell right into it. It was like this thing. And then it kind of continued during college. I got more comfortable being in the, in the cage <laughs> with the weights <laughs> and I lost like 30, 35 pounds and really transformed kind of like, uh, my body and kind of like my perception on uh, fitness and wellness and food and how that, you know, connects to you in your life as well. So, and that can, it continued into graduate school. And at the time it was like, this is cool. I can teach a couple classes. I can make a couple bucks while I'm in school. Um, I can, it helps me keep, you know, keep me somewhat connected to fitness and my body. And it just started kind of blossoming from there. Yeah. I love that story. <laughs> yeah. I also like totally visualize the the entire thing. Um, and it's so funny. I think I asked our community this like a year ago. I was like, does anybody like count 
everything to eight counts. And I was not a dancer before pound. It wasn't, you know, built in me. But to this day, like my dog goes to the bathroom and I count to an eight count <laughs> for the cat cooking. <laughs> like, what is wrong with me? So I, I, I totally understand that. You And you said something else that really stood out to me and that I think a lot of people will relate to. The gym is... For me, I was an athlete my whole life, so literally up until the point of after my college years, I had never really stepped into a normal like gym environment. Um, we always were in like training centers, and when I did, I it it's a very it can be a very intimidating environment, especially mm-hmm. on the outside of the group fitness room and. I think you brought up something so beautiful about group fitness. There's there's this safety net that happens within a group fitness room. I don't know exactly what it is. I know that I've only felt it in, you know, group fitness classes or in the pound experience. There's no way I would ever stand in front of a group of people at any other period of my life other than pound. And I there there's something about that that had to carry you through because your your career blew up i mean from dvds to managing like that was a you're still a big 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 name in the fitness industry what about that like carried you through and kept you going you know i'll be honest with you and i think this would re- you could relate to this as well because i i see it in in you and what you've done as well it was a kind of um a spirit of being guided particularly by the idea that fitness helped me and when i found community it helped Mm. me and so creating that kind of community and not being the barking instructor or the break you down to build you up instructor i was like i wanted to adopt this idea of building bridges between like knowing and unknowing and i don't know how to do this move or i don't know what's going to work for me and then building that bridge through fitness and also connectivity and really like looking at someone and saying here's what i think might be right for you but you got to try and figure it out on your own to create that independence as well so that's like one thing like letting letting your heart guide you in terms of like what truly is the purpose of fitness is like you're feeling good about yourself obviously because you're building a stronger you know, and and more agile and more efficient and more balanced body, but you're also building all of those benefits into your life as well, right? You're building agility and efficiency and balance of thought and food and like interactions and relationships. So I saw correlation into everyday life. And because of that, it didn't just become a job, it became kind of like a way of living. And so the second part of it, which I think you can connect to is like entrepreneurship is like actually wanting to create um, mm-hmm. Rather than just be like, okay, well, I'll just do kind of like a, you know, uh, a, a whatever like the gym wants me to do. It's like, no, I want to really go out there and create something and 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 let other people uh, who may not have the same kind of experiences either in the gym or out of the gym. Like, I want them to have the same experience. I want I want this feeling that I feel to kind of go out into the world a little bit more. And so I'm going to try to create something much like you guys did with Pound. Um, I did with, you know, what, what I called, what, what was actually called the Katami Bar, um, mm-hmm. which was a product that I developed out of like working with um, rehab patients. I actually worked at a rehab facility um, and I was a real personal trainer that worked with physical therapists to help people bridge the gap between their last session of physical therapy and kind of a regular everyday exercise program so that they wouldn't lose the gains that they had kind of, you know, um, achieved and the results they had achieved to help them out of their physical therapy. And it was a huge experience for me because I got to see everyone from, you know, athletes that were very young and agile that had like slight injuries, muscular injuries, um, or recovering from, you know, slight injuries to someone, you know, I'll never forget my client, Daniel, who had Parkinson's and was having mm. struck like, like, had to just walk like his thing was, I just want to walk, I want my gait to be right. And so on any given week, seeing that gamut, it just really made me think, like, how can I help more people? How can I get out there and do this more? And one of my the clients at the time had a really bad neck impingement, so he couldn't do crunches or ab work. And it was really like kind of seeping into his life in a way that was causing depression and anxiety. And, you know, it was just anger about it. 
And so we talked about rotation from the core and absorbing force in different ways. Um, you know, just going back to good old science. And I went to Home Depot one day and got a bunch of books out and bent. I literally had like, I was in their tool shed. Like I need, I need a pipe bender. <laughs> like I need a, <laughs> like your industrial size pipe bender. And I bent a couple of pipes into different angles that would kind of, you know, help him put this bar under his arm so he could rotate. And I brought it to him in a session and he was like, like in tears. He was like, I can feel this. Like this is working. And I didn't think, oh yeah, this is amazing. We did something awesome. It was more like, I'm so glad. I'm so relieved for you that you can find a solution when you were thinking you couldn't find a solution. Cut to, you know, I myself having an injury, a pretty bad injury actually in my arm that I laid on the floor of my apartment one day, like just like just exhausted by the whole situation of being injured and not being able to make, you know, a living off of what I used to do and having to kind of reset my mind and kind of like focus. Um, I looked under my couch and there it was. And that bar helped me rehab my body. And then it became a class at crunch. And then I got an offer to do an infomercial with it. And it was one of those things where that injury, that injury to me, well, first of all, the clients that I had, you know, going back to my first point, the clients in that population and seeing the like the, the vast kind of difference between like A to Z of, of people and understanding that that's what fitness is really about. And then two, you know, bending that bar in Home Depot. And then three, using that bar for myself, leading to a really popular class at Crunch and getting lots of PR and media coverage on it. And then going into the 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 world of production for infomercials, it was so transformative that I took it as an opportunity and created my own production company and was doing my own DVDs. And I just kept creating and I just kept creating and I just kept creating. And I didn't know where it was going to go, but I did know that it was like where my heart wanted to take me every day. And mm. so I was just, I found myself lucky that I fell into that class. I mean, if that instructor never showed up on that day or you know didn't not show up on that day, would I have found the same arc or trajectory Maybe, but I like to think that the universe kind of dots the line for us. And then we step back one day and the dotted line is really a solid line because that's what's really supposed to be happening. I, I believe in that. Um, it's why I always push people to, to write in their journals because as a younger person, I would write, you know, when you're so dramatic and you're like a teenager and you're like, why is this happening? And then you go <laughs> back three months later and you're like, Oh, and, and I think when you can start trusting in your, your own intuition and there was something in you, even if, cause this is when it happens. And I've heard this story a lot, even if you're not that person, you're not the person that would stand up, not being prepared, something in you intuitively said, you know, do it. And you ran across the street and you did it. And I think it's so powerful hearing stories about people tapping into that. And I think you you continued to do that to listen to yourself and you said something else that i think for anybody who is an entrepreneur is really important because i think starting and creating can be really intimidating in itself but all you did was you tried to create a solution for a problem that you saw and that wasn't this huge business model and it wasn't this huge contraption you simply took something that you saw a problem and found a very easy solution for it. And it doesn't have to be complicated, right? Um, and I and I love that. And I think that's important because I think the starting part is really scary for a lot of people, um, which is why I love your story. And then you just kept listening and listening and and doing and doing and evolving with with it. Not many people would think, oh, I you know, see this production part of it. Why don't I just do that myself? Mm. Um, but I think that's, that's so cool and an important lesson. I do believe that like sometimes life just puts something in front of you and you can see it as an opportunity, not, not, like not, not an opportunistic way, like Absolutely, I'm take, yeah. taking advantage, but mm -hmm. it's the opportunity to enlighten yourself a little bit more to figure out whether or not I'm, listen, I'm, I'm legitimately the guy who lives his life these days and I've grown into this. I've not, not always been great at it and I'm not perfect at it now per se, but I have a motto that my friends even say to me all the time. They're like, you're the guy who says, don't let the no, N-O, 
screw up the no K and O W, right? <laughs> like because we're so used to like judging from what we don't know because what we think we might experience versus experiencing it and then going, I love that. I'm doing that every day. Or gosh, I didn't like that at all. Or I'm not like I'm, that's not something I enjoy. So at least I tried it and I can come from a place of knowledge. So that is to me where the opportunity comes up because you, the opportunity to kind of expand and even change. And, you know, sometimes we fall into these habits of life that are like habits in fitness. And I'll draw the parallel using science is like, uh, and I just said this yesterday, adaptation versus accommodation, right? So either you accommodate and you live in stasis and you're comfortable there. And that's great. And some people like that, that's their comfort zone. That's like where they want to be. And I think that's amazing. But I live my life in adaptation. And that's fitness because you want your muscles and your body to adapt to new forces and new types of movement and new types of you know load and, 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 and emphasis and activation. And I take that and translate that to my life every day. And I'm always like, let's try that. Or why wouldn't we do that? Or sure, let's explore that. Or I'm going to say yes to that and see what happens. Um, and it has really transformed my life in a way to be able to express myself through that process versus the process of, ah, I don't know, or would that maybe happen? Or last time I heard that this, or like, I'm just like, and I used to be that guy. I used to be like, let me research every option. Let me figure out every angle before I do anything because I need to mitigate the risk. I need to figure out like how this is going to affect me. I'm like, you know what? It's just a thing and let's just figure it out. And I'm not like going to put myself at risk or in danger. I'm not going to put anyone else at risk or in danger. I'm just going to like experience this stuff. And there's an opportunity there. Why not explore the opportunity and try it and see what it's about? And you can come from a pace of knowledge versus a place of no. That's the, the most beautiful message I think you can send. And I think we've been talking about that a lot at Pound specifically in our, our current state. You you don't change without being uncomfortable. And whether it's that first class or trying something that scares you or something that's foreign or different, um, how do we evolve if we don't say yes to those scenarios? Right. Um, I, I'm a, I, I kind of <laughs> skewed on the other end of the spectrum, maybe too far, where I was like, just do everything. And I didn't like, maybe I should have put a little bit more thought to it, but it, it's so true. You you can't really grow or evolve um, without taking those chances or trying new things. And it doesn't always have to be big, crazy things. It could be trying new foods or a new workout or, or whatnot. Um, You're exactly right. You're exactly right. It's so funny because I'm and I've become that guy like I'm like, I don't filter any more thoughts. Sometimes I'm like, oh, God, this might sound deep or weird or whatever. But, <laughs> but here, here's what I'm feeling right now. And I'll be honest with you, that has been the more profound thing. Like, you know, like people like respond to that and they love that. So to your point, like I just was talking about pride because it's Pride Month. And I was like, we need to live our lives with a little more proud moments. They don't have to be hugely consequential, but they can be. So to your point, what you were saying is like, just do it, like go out there and do it. I mean, and whatever, like things work out the way they're supposed to work out, mm -hmm. you know? And so regardless of what part of the spectrum you are in that, as long as you're not living from the experience of no, which you just mentioned, like people were afraid of their first class or whatever it might be, like no is so powerful because it's based in fear and fear is so powerful because it keeps us from understanding and knowing. So like, why not just eliminate fear and know as much as you can in your life so that you can live it a little bit more kind of like freely versus being guided by fear and know. Okay. We can end now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, if you could see me right now, I would just like have my head up and I had this huge smile on my face, but I mean, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I, I think it's a beautiful place to transition to, um, a part of your life that is so incredible, but also took a whole, whole, whole lot of courage. Um, and so for, for our listeners, um, a little back story in, um, 2008, the California Supreme court ruled that same sex couples had the right to get married. And if I am correct, I think there were about 18,000 same-sex couples that were married throughout the state of California. And then six months later, um, voters passed Prop 8, 
um, which was an initiative which would define marriage as between one man and one woman in California, which I think happened on the or came on the same night that Obama was accepting his presidency and a federal lawsuit was filed on behalf of two couples. Um, and one of those two couples were you and your now husband, Jeff. And I would love if you could, for our community, tell us a little bit more about Prop 8 in layman's terms, what happened, um, met thousands of couples went from being married to not being married. And I know it was a long journey to dismiss, but please share your story and your experience um, because it was a very courageous one. And from my understanding, you and the other couple were chosen to, to represent in this case and be the plaintiffs. And that is uh, a very large responsibility. Well, yes, thank you for asking the question and the intro uh, about kind of what I'd call the activist part of my life. Uh, and for a long time, that word activist was kind of like a negatively connotated. It was like people like, oh, an activist. But I really wear that with a badge of pride now because I understand the process of fighting really for what you truly believe in and fighting until, um, you know, with, with conviction until you win. Um, so yes, uh, Proposition 8 was a 2008 initiative and that was to ban marriage equality in California after the state had allowed, the state Supreme Court had allowed people to get married for a number of months uh, during which 18,000 couples plus got married. And then that right was stripped away um, in November um, and you're right, it was the same night that uh, President Barack Obama accepted his presidency. And so we were elated on one hand to see this progress and hope really win. And then also devastated to understand that our neighbors in California, that you know our state voted against our basic fundamental rights to have the same access to marriage um, and what I mean by the same access to marriage, but also the same access to marriage, like the, the laws that are protective um, as well. You know, that's, that's a bigger part than just the celebratory part or the nuptials is like all the protections that go along with that. And so it was it was devastating. And, and if we cut to today, you know, along the way in 2013, you know, we, we filed our lawsuit in 2009. In 2013, our lawsuit was settled at the Supreme Court saying that Prop 8 was fully unconstitutional, that, you know, absolutely that LGBTQ plus community had the right, the fundamental right to, to marry. And based on that, um, you know, we then saw every state that did not have marriage equality um, immediately have a lawsuit citing our case and Edie Windsor's case in DOMA about, you know, about marriage equality. And so based on that, in 2015, the Obergefell case with like 30 plus plaintiffs took it over the finish line. And in that case, we were very we were minimal on the number of cases uh, that or states that had that did not have marriage equality. So that being said, we 2013 to 2015, like, you know, just tremendous time and years of equality uh, that took us, you know, one step further in process in the process of the fight for full equality. So what we realized along the way is marriage was one vehicle to really affirming that the law is black and white when it comes to representation and equality in this country. What the undercurrent was is that people really didn't understand, which brings us to today, which was so profound and historic, is that along the way, protections outside of marriage still didn't exist in this country in the majority of states. So people's like minds were blown when I would say, yes, we won marriage rights. And they're like, well, aren't you done? And I'm like, no, <laughs> like, there's so much more. I mean, marriage federally came along with over 1,100 rights that we were prohibited up until 2015. So people were like, wait, what? I don't understand. Like, yeah, that was actually something that you could have access to that we as LGBTQ Americans did not. And on top of that, in the majority of states in this country, you could be fired or denied housing and even some states health care 
or legal protections based on your orientation or how you identify. Yep. And 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 you could just like I have close friends that are not LGBTQ that were dumbfounded by this. They were like, "Wait, what? I, I had no idea this was a thing." So along the way, there have been multiple undercurrents of, of fights and struggles and lawsuits um, and public education campaigns and people going out and affirming, you know, what is to be true, that if you look at the Supreme Court of the United States, it says etched on that building equal justice under law. And we were not experiencing that as a minority community, much like many minority communities and women and immigrants um, and, and black Americans were not treated equally and as hu- as like, like full human beings even it's it's you know the, the be, defining someone as less than human and denying someone the right to vote and denying someone the right to housing and education and de- denying marriage of an interracial couple I mean like you look through our history and it's peppered with these civil rights arguments and the argument is based in what anyone would think is an argument that should not be happening. When you ask anyone on any street corner in the United States, you should be able to say, do you believe that everyone in this country should be treated equally under the law? And that person should really resoundingly say yes. But if then you say, but what if they're interracial couple or what if they're trans? What if they're bi gay? What if they're, and they say, no, well, I cut out, I carve out, you know, rights for those people that I can have that they shouldn't because of some reason. We have a big problem in our country. That's a huge, it's a fundamental and systemic issue that we need to we need to fight for. And the law is there to protect us with that. So public opinion may be debated for a long time, but people who struggle people who suffer, people who are oppressed, and people who die during a time in their lives where they can't even be treated equally because there's a public discourse happening, that's when the law steps in. That's when we need to be protected by the rules and the regulations and the backbone of our country, which is fundamentally that everyone should be treated equally under the law with freedom and justice and liberty. So today on June 15th, 2020, we have a massive historic ruling from the Supreme Court based on two cases that we can no longer as a country discriminate people in the workplace and fire them for being LGBTQ. Mm-hmm. And it is a momentous movement that will protect people. I mean, over 7 million LGBT or reported 7 million LGBTQ people live in states where they could be fired. So you can imagine... Um, just how treacherous it would be to have the right to marry someone you love over the weekend and to put their fo- your photograph on your desk on Monday or Tuesday and be fired for it. Or if your landlord of your complex has to enter your home because you have a piping issue and they see a photo of, you know, you and your husband or you and your wife or and and it, and and you're gay or bisexual or transgender and they recognize that they could kick you out of their out of their property for it in this country as well and most people kind of like scratch their heads and say that's not the country i want to be living in and i'm glad to say that today that through the efforts over time including the one that you know that chris and sandy and jeff and i were in in our case because chris and sandy were one of those couples who were married and then got a letter after prop 8 saying your marriage mm-hmm. is null and void here's your registration money back or if you'd like we donate it to some place but you're not married anymore sorry like can you imagine being treated that way yeah. so today we have this momentous kind of thing that has happened and it is like cellular in a way you can feel it whether you can take a little bit more of a deeper breath and understand that people that are similarly situated to you people like me across this country that could be at risk for losing their livelihood can no longer uh no or i should say no longer have to fear that and that mm-hmm. is huge and that is again that dotted line right it's that dotted line we we, we did not start a movement, we continued a movement, and the movement still continues on because there's so much more oppression, um, not only in the LGBTQ community, but in so many underrepresented um, and underprivileged communities because of politics or policing or because of you know awful rules and regulations and bills and legislation that's gone out there that actually builds fences around americans and tells them that they cannot be treated equally we got to tear those we got to burn those fences down <laughs> one at a time absolutely i we're going to go back to to that um 
towards the end because I want to talk about what what those next movements are and the actions are that are needed. There's a couple of things um, that I just want to touch on um, that really stood out to me when I watched um, the documentary, The Case Against Eight, which if the community has not watched it, I highly recommend it. Um, and I know this is and was a question in, in, in many people's minds and um, certainly uh, makes, well, I'll just, I want to make sure this is clear. Um, why marriage, um, by definition, with the same sex is so important that being defined that way rather than a domestic partnership? Mm. It's a really good question because we were told, well, you can get the same rights if you want, just get a domestic partnership. And I'm like, okay, well, let's talk about the process <laughs> of what that means. It means hiring lawyers and you know, making affidavits happen and spending a lot of money making sure that estates and wills and, you know, um, you know, medical records. And I mean, you go through such a huge process just to access your state's protections to be called something other than marriage. And people say, well, it's just semantics. Why are you trying to redefine what marriage means? Because historically marriage is between a man and a woman. And we said, no, it is not actually. By the way, you don't celebrate domestic partnership, you know, with a cake. Like you don't, like, you know, you don't have like people come to, you know, a ceremony for your domestic partnership. There's that part of it as well, where you're excluding people, the joy, the happiness and filling a space with love and friends and family, which is a huge part of it. People say it's the most, one of the most important days of their lives. And you're saying, well, you don't need to have that. You could just go get some paperwork done. And, you know, so why ruin marriage for everybody? Again, you can sound, you can, you can feel how silly that sounds, right? Yeah. So, when we, so when we launched our case, the same question was proposed, and this is the best way for me to answer this question. And it's hopefully, I think, I mean, we're actually, believe it or not, this coming week, there's going to be hearing on releasing our testimony and all the expert testimony from the video on that case. So keep your no fingers way. crossed. Yeah, oh yeah, that gosh. might become public at some point. So you can actually watch this amazing trial. Oh my gosh. So the, the you know, we had opposing counsel, obviously, there was a, a lawyer on the other side. And the and this is the this is this is the really the kind of crux of it to answer your question why marriage the judge in the case asked the opposing counsel i want to ask you a question because ultimately to bring forth a case like this to fight against the right to access that everyone should basically have you need to show that there is some injustice or harm that is done to people who are not LGBTQ that are married, right? So why do we have a bright line between people who can access and cannot access this? So what is that harm? And the opposing lawyer kind of stammered and stuttered and stuttered and stammered. And then the judge said, let me put it this way. Let's say we're on the same ball field. Say I'm on your side. Like, you know, we're hunkering down, preparing for trial. And you have to tell me the why. Like, what is the why? What is the harm that allowing Paul and Jeff and Chris and Sandy to be married, what harm does that inflict on anyone else? So enhancing their lives through marriage is one thing, but you're saying you need to be in court to define that marriage is one thing that excludes them. Why that? And he stammered and stammered and stammered. And the judge was like, I'm giving you the opportunity to let everybody know why you're here. What's the harm? Stammered, 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 and then muttered, I don't know. Don't know. Yeah. He said it twice. It's and so there was an crazy. audible gasp in the courtroom. Audible, because it's almost like saying, I'm stomping my feet. I'm sure of this. And then someone goes, why? And you go, I don't know. Like, there wasn't even a legitimate like reason. And then they called it responsible procreation because, oh, marriage is about procreating. And the judge was like, so if I am 70 and I'm widowed and I want to marry someone who's 70 and widowed, uh, we're, we can't get married because we can't procreate, you know, like this doesn't make sense. So we just kept debunking these concepts. And we realized that when you peel away the concepts, they were based in fear, they were based in discrimination, they were based in misinformation, they were based in demonizing some idea of human beings versus seeing human beings and understanding who they are. And so the access to those rights 
was protected by law. I don't care what you think about me. I really don't because what I know I need to do is protect myself and be treated equally. And that's what our case was about. And marriage, by the way, is not a religious institution. It became one. But if you think about the rights associated with marriage, they're not religious rights. They are civil rights. And that's what we were fighting for to find that marriage is not defined by religion or theology. It's defined by equal treatment under the law. Talk to me about the day that, I don't know if you got a phone call, like these are your your basic civil rights and, and this um, proposition passes and somebody says, we want you to be the plaintiff on this case. What goes through your head? Like, it, obviously this is this is huge and there were two couples like what went through your head when when that um happened well i will okay here's another funny story that is how we became plaintiffs on this lawsuit um so what happened was after prop 8 passed there was an organization called the national organization for marriage and it was run by Maggie Gallagher at the time. She had seen an opportunity. Like we talked about earlier, right? But I talked about opportunities. Like, well, <laughs> they saw an opportunity to take advantage of this because I hate to say it, but inequality is big business. A lot of people will donate a lot of money because this particular issue is like the issue of, you know, being pro-life or like, you know, in terms of like race and systemic racism or whatever, like, you know, there, unfortunately our, our country has kind of an ugly history with this, mm-hmm. these battles and people will open their pocketbooks to fund organizations to that, that, that outwardly claim their mission statement is like, you know, matches their kind of whatever their position is. So going back to Prop 8, when it passed, Um, the National Organization for Marriage put out an awful video called The Gathering Storm. And it basically said, listen, we can't let gay people get married because it's akin to a storm that's coming that will strip you away of your rights and hurt your children. And like, it it was just, it was so awful. It was crazy. Jeff, my husband was pushing, well, my husband now at the time was pushing me to watch this. He goes, this is going to make you mad, Paul. I'm like, I don't know why I want to watch something that's going to make me mad, dude. I don't want to do that. And he's like, no. And he's like, I know activist Paul is going to come out. So what happened is I watched this video and I literally put my laptop down. I stood up on the couch and I said, that's it. That is it. And this was probably like on a Wednesday. And then I called some friends in production and I called a bunch of friends. Now, mind you, we called friends that were clergy of different, like, de- you know, denominations. We called friends that were actors. We called friends that were Broadway stars. We called friends that were like, you know, that, that we had concentric circles in terms of people that we knew had influence at the time. We called families that had gay children. We called, you know, uh, gay parents. We called like just uh, all of our friends and said, can we meet up on Sunday and shoot a response video to this that actually debunks the misinformation. That's basically like, what are you talking about? And so, and it was long story longer, but shorter than it, you know, than it could be. Um, we shot a response video and we put it up on YouTube and it, at the time it was quote unquote by like a several hundred thousand views over the course of one night. It went worldwide. The next day I get a phone call from like Wolf Blitzer and CNN and all these places like, well, you do interviews. And I'm like, what is happening? They're like, oh yeah, activists. I'm like, I'm not an activist. I'm just a guy who was sick and tired of tre- being treated this way. Mm. And so one little thing, you know, that one little thing led us to uh, the team of people that were considering a federal lawsuit. And they called and said, hey, listen, like, what are your thoughts on this? And I'm like, federal lawsuit, this is not a state to state patchwork of rights, because if I move from California to a different state that won't protect me, then guess what? I lose protections. Like, that's not what we should be calling the United States of America, because it's like fractioned. And so they were like, we agree. And we met and we went through a very deep process of, you know, figuring out whether or not we would be um, willing to do this. But there was never any question. If it were to happen, we wanted it to happen. And Chris and Sandy were doing the same thing at the same time, independently of us with the same group of people. And then we all came together and said, this is what needs to happen. And that's what we're like, that's how the American Foundation for Equal Rights was born. That's how our case was born. And the rest, as they say, is history. Mm. You're a hero. Oh my God, don't say that. <laughs> You're going to you make are. me uncomfortable now. You are. You no, are. What it, I know what I am. I am like anybody else that wants to elicit change. Yeah. I really am. Like, really, I'm like, I mean, a guy like living in Burbank, you know, that just is like, I'm enough is enough. And so. Yeah, but it also, I mean, yes, you are very right. But 
you were on a, a national scale you that it takes a lot of courage to do that um and you know thank god um but you are a hero you can't don't let me don't don't take that away from me i'm sorry <laughs> Just I, I, I should learn to i still haven't you know it's funny like jeff and i did world pride last year in new york and it was like four million extra people in new york and we were very 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 grateful to be asked to be ambassadors to world pride because of our activism and so we had a very full schedule of like going around and experiencing pride events in such a profound and beautiful way and we got to be in the pride parade and we were like, you know, on a float, we passed Stonewall and mm-hmm. we heard people calling our names and we thought, oh my God, they're supposed to be friends. And people kind of were running up to us and being like, you understand, like I, we got married because of you and I can't believe we're seeing you. And even then, this was last year, mind you, like how many years removed from our lawsuit, even then it was hard to accept. We're like, no, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, it's hard to like think that something that you do with so much passion and so much clarity in your life that people will think highly of you for it. It was more about necessity for us. So thank you for that. But it's still to this day hard <laughs> to compliment about it. I, I understand. I, I have to say it. And I, I was um, reading a LA Times article. I think that was in like 2013. And it just the quote, it made me tear up. It says at 6.15 on Friday, June 28th, Prop 8 plaintiffs Paul Katami and Jeff Cirillo got married at LA City Hall. They were the first same-sex couple to do so in Los Angeles after Prop 8 was dismissed. What did that feel like? Oh my God, that day is incredible. Um, but it was also, you should know this, we did not plan to get married that day. So <laughs> just FYI. Really? No, we did not. Like um, two days prior, June 26 was the ruling of the Supreme Court. So we had been flying back and forth to Washington, D.C. every week on the week that rulings were going to be announced because you just don't know when your ruling is going to come down. So mind you, Jeff and I had been on a plane every few days back and forth to Washington, D.C., like exhausted, like red eyes coming back. There was a couple of times we flew out on a red eye and got there at whatever time in the morning, the rulings would come out mid morning and we get on a plane an hour later and come home just because we didn't get a ruling. So we were a little exhausted, but June 26th was a great day. Our ruling came down, huge press. The president called us, it was insane. It was this awesome thing. We fly back to Los Angeles. We do this rally in West Hollywood with, I don't even know how many thousands of people. We gave speeches, we gave hugs, we saw friends and we got home at three o'clock in the morning. And we woke up at seven and went to work, which our friends that we were crazy for doing, but we're like, we've got to pay the, we got to pay the bills, y'all. So <laughs> that was, um, uh, and then, and then it was the next day after that, I'm at work and I get a phone call from the foundation that helped put together our lawsuit. And they were like, just so you know, um, there's usually prerequisite 25 to 30 days. So we were planning to get married at some point in July, just because the day that the stay was lifted would be a, the first day marriages could be enacted. And we we're like, okay, let's be the first in line to get married. Yeah. That was 25 to 30 days. Mind you, this is day two. And we get a phone call from our legal team saying the ninth circuit is meeting today. The ninth circuit of appeals, which would be the one circuit of appeals in California that to lift the stay and allow people to get married. Um, and we're like, okay, like we think that they are holding this special meeting to kind of eliminate this idea of 25 to 30 days and say, just go get married now if you want to. So y'all might need to get married today if you want to be the first. And so we're like, wait, what? And there's a moment in the documentary, if you watch the documentary, it's that always gets a laugh from Jeff where you can see my face like, wait, what? <laughs> like, wait, what? When am I getting married today? So literally they're like norwalk will be the only um office that's open in terms of a county registrar so get in an uber blah 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 blah, get dressed pack a suit whatever it might be and so it was this whirlwind where we left work and we got into an uber and we went down to norwalk and they're like if they announce this like you got to jump in there and get your license and then we jumped in and it happened and then but kamala harris had to call on our behalf to make sure we got our license because they hadn't gotten a directive from the state yet and it was this whirlwind and then you know um at the time mayor antonio viragosa was very very supportive of us throughout our case but it was his last day of office he was leaving he was on some farewell tour and he called and said i want to marry you and we're like okay and he's like come to city hall and i'm like okay and then literally we had a call from the rachel maddow show saying we'd like to 
like have your wedding live broadcast across the country. And we're like, wait, what? And so all of this happened in this course of like two hours. So we get to City Hall in suits, whirlwind. And they said, would you guys like to have a minute alone? And I remember Jeff was like, no, no, we're okay. I'm like, no, we need a minute alone. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, when you talk, and I looked at him, and I remember, like, getting very emotional. I said, you know, over the course of all this, we fought so hard for this, but I want to look you in the eye and tell you, I want to marry you more now than I've ever wanted to marry you. Like, this is, like, this is it. Like, I don't care that it's under these circumstances and that our family can't be here and that it's going to be broadcast on television. I'm going to look in your eyes and marry you because I've been waiting my whole life to marry you. And it was really one of those moments where it was like nothing else mattered, which gave us clarity on what marriage means in terms of like love and the relationship. So, yes, it was um, it's a long story, but I think it's a meaningful story because the clarity that came with it is the thing that we still hold dear today in our marriage is knowing that we didn't just get married to get married. We got married because it was the right thing for us and, and the right thing for our community. You, you got my, my, my pregnant, my pregnant ass crying over here. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse the language. No, it, it's okay. It's all right. But I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was, a, it was the whole process taught us a lot, but it's not the only fight, obviously, right? So that's the other thing is like, we were able to contribute where we could contribute when it was time for us to contribute. And now we contribute in different ways, but we can lend our experiences to other people in oppressed communities to say, we went through something, it may not be exactly the same or even similar, but ultimately at the bottom line, the foundation of what we're fighting for is equality and being treated like a first class citizen and that we can join our concentric circles on. And if that helps us build a deeper communication and understanding about our fight and your fight, having some point of connection, then let us help you in any way we can. So let's let's talk about that. So today, obviously a very historic day with the Civil Rights Act um, of 1964, right? Protecting Mm -hmm. the LGBTQ plus community, um, which you painted the picture. It's one step, you know, same-sex marriage was one very, very, very big um, victory. But if you can't walk into work or your apartment the next day and feel safe and protected, we're not there yet, right? So- Mm -hmm. We have what I imagine is a long road ahead of us. What are in your eyes still some of the, you know, many serious issues facing the community and and what can we do as allies and activists to address them, bring awareness to them um, and so on? There are so many different levels of activism based in communities feeling oppressed in our country. Um, And, you know, I can only speak to our, I mean, you look around the world and there's, you know, really deep oppression happening as well. So it's not about comparison. It's about correlation. It's about the correlation of the things that we fight for as human beings, regardless of what the specific topic is, because some topics are going to be more grave and more intense, and some will be a little more like revelatory and like fighting for love. And some people are like, well, we're fighting for our lives right now because our oppression includes being targeted, like our trans community and our black community. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, the gay community and the bisexual and transgender community, I mean, we've been through it as well. So there, there, I believe that coalescing is, it takes minority groups and makes them majority. So if we just come together, guess what happens? We start to tear down the walls of discrimination together. And we may, we, we may each have our own kind of like topic, the thing that we need to fight for. But if we collectively fight and loan kind of our voices and energy to each other's fights, then we then become the majority voice. And that to me is the most profound thing, but it doesn't happen because what happens is over the course of history, I believe oppression does one thing. It creates infighting within smaller communities because we're fighting for what we feel we should never have to fight for. And because of that, there isn't a clear path. There isn't a clear strategy. It's like everyone has ideas like, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? We have to fight for our rights in our lives. And 
unfortunately, the true, and I say this all the time, is like when we're so busy being a circular firing squad, like against each other, we neglect to sometimes turn around and see who the true fight needs to be against in terms of the oppressors and, you know, the the things that are, that are holding us down. And I'll be honest with you, right now we're under a strange time in our country where, you know, there is an administration governing our country that is creating more faction than cohesion. And however you want to look at it, whatever your affiliation, you I think that's undeniable to me. And so I look at that as kind of like a like the result of what's happening in smaller communities where they're saying, we don't want to fight for special rights. We don't need to have special rights. We just need to have the same rights. We're not mm-hmm. fighting to have more money given to us. We're fighting for equilibrium across how different communities are being developed and how different kids growing up have different opportunities as they grow up. If we can just in this country create a little more equilibrium there, we can maybe find more equality over time and start to heal some of these wounds and divides like in the in our community in the lgbt community we're still like listen just last week you know we de- denying transgender health care is a thing you know even though today you can't be fired but like now and, and also lgbtq like we still haven't addressed housing like people could still be kicked out of their homes if you don't own your home and someone else does and they find out you're lgbtq guess what you could be kicked out we're still not really at a place where uh services can not deny people for being LGBTQ. We see that with the cake cases and so on and so forth that are happening, you know, floral cases and photographers that, that, that basically decline a service that they would decline to anybody else because you're gay. I'm like, well, wait, are you putting the same filter on the couple that comes in that might be interracial but heterosexual? Are you putting the same filter on the couple that might be Muslim but you don't know? Are you still asking them the questions? Because if you hold the deep-seated, rooted discrimination against gay people that you don't want to make their cake or take their picture or do their floor arrangement, but you also have the same discrimination against other people for whatever reason, are you putting them through the same tests. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of like equilibrium. Like we have to create a society with systems in place that treat people equally. So regardless of your discrimination, at least, at least discriminate equally, right? Like don't pick and choose. And that's the thing that's infuriating in a way, because you wish that you would have administrations and court systems that protect people from the humanitarian side of it versus from the political or the discriminatory kind of view side. And that's unfortunately what's happening right now. This is why I believe that our vote is the most powerful thing, it's the most powerful weapon we can use against discrimination and inequality. Um, You know, going out there in the streets, as we know, I mean, George Floyd's death has really sparked a revolution in this country again, but it's the revolution that we've seen in the past that has now to come back again with more vigor and more force and more support because nothing has changed in between. And so to elicit this change, we have fights and and we can go into lots of different topics, but I want to talk a little more broadly about this is we have the right to go out and argue. We have the right to go out and, and peacefully protest and create disruption that makes people focus and have hard conversations. And we need to also be protected by our court systems, our law, and our administration that governs our country to help us with those protections. And I just don't think we're at that place right now. I, I absolutely agree. And I think that something at a, a more micro level came up in a conversation we had on our Instagram live a couple of days ago that in regards to our, our black community and our black brothers and sisters, there is no same black story, right? There there are many stories, there are many levels and layers. And I think um, it's the same in the LGBTQ community. And unless you're starting conversations, unless you're asking questions, unless you're exploring um, and diversifying your friend groups, you're never going to know, first and foremost, um, the importance of some of the things that you might need to vote for or against. And I think that's a a good place to start for maybe people who are don't know where to start. Um, but I think the more we speak to each other, the more we listen to podcasts, which is why I love podcasts or w- watch documentaries. It's, it's about educating ourselves. And I think when it comes to voting, 
it's one thing to go out and vote. It's another to do your homework and really mm-hmm. understand the depths mm-hmm. um, and the ripple effects that your decisions when you go to vote um, will make. It's not just about like getting the sticker right and taking the Instagram post. It's it, you have to do your homework. That's our responsibility. Um, and I hope people understand that. That's a huge point. Like you just made such a huge point because people will take a bumper sticker argument 30 seconds on a new show. I had someone argue with me about a certain podcast I listened to, to a certain person who has nothing to do with science or the medical world whatsoever, giving advice on this epidemic pandemic that we have. Going I know on. exactly what podcast yeah. you're talking about. And I was, I was like, wait, you're taking one snippet. And I, you know, I don't argue with my friends, but I do like to find a path to discuss it, discuss it without, you know, creating an awful debate about it. But I'm like, time out. How about we do, rather than listening to one thing that then validates how you feel, so then that validates your actions, how about you kind of like take the time to understand that this, you know, this particular thing, and I I relate it to COVID-19 because it has really become a situation where people have had to hard, have hard conversations. Who have you seen? Where have you been? You know, there's this like deeper kind of like understanding what people's limits are to controlling themselves and their environments under these circumstances. Same thing goes for voting. Like you make a really good point. Oh, I heard this. Wait, you vote on this? Like this is perfect. We'll go back to yes on eight. Yes on eight was affirmative. So some people actually voted. My mother had to call me at the time and say, wait, I'm voting no on this, right? And I was like, oh, my God, like, yeah, this is what happens when, like, you know, systematically mm-hmm. misinfor- misinformation is met with, you know, ugly strategy in a way. And if you start to unpeel that and you start to understand that and you're like, oh, my God, I'm starting to now be more educated in this. And I use the word ignorant in, a, in the best possible way. I have been ignorant and I've been able to overcome ignorance. Right. That's mm-hmm. the thing. Like, that's the thing about ignorance. That's cool. Is like you can educate yourself and be like, wow, I didn't know that. And now I do know that and I can it can help me have a much more meaningful response or action in my life. And I think you made a, such a great point. Like people vote down party line without thinking. And that's frightening to me because I would say if I, the party affiliation that I have, if I had a, a, a candidate that I wholeheartedly disagreed with and had fundamental fractures in terms of morality and truth and ability and you know readiness to run a country i would be like i'm out like i'm going to vote for a different uh I, I would potentially consider voting for a different party because i want what's best for the country versus what's best for my party mm-hmm. you know? and, mm-hmm. and that translates to a lot of things right it translates to like and you can take politi- politics out of it. You can make it about religion or equal rights or abortion or gay rights or whatever it might be. Like you can, you can, you can look through the lens of process and understanding to get you to a place where your actions are more meaningful, for sure. My last question is one that I almost don't know how to position, but I know that personally with my elders, with people who are much older than me within my own family, explaining to them, helping them understand. I know so many people um, around the world in the last couple of months um, with COVID, with the Black Lives Matter movement, with Pride, there are a lot of rifts in families. As you know, there's a lot of pain and suffering because of the lack of knowledge, um, the um, fear-based decisions and leadership and um, just family environment. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if you can answer this, but it's like, what do you say? What do you say to somebody to get them to understand? Because it's something that I've been personally struggling with within my own family. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, I recently had a family member come out and, and you, if it's your parents, if your grandparents, people who you love and respected your whole life, how do you help guide them? Um, or if they're listening now, um, mm. what do you say to them? Come to dinner. Yeah. Come to dinner. Come to my house. Sit. Let me feed you. If you have a partner or you're married, come understand that our lives are no different than yours, that our love is just as strong and that our happiness is 
no different than yours when we have access to those things without discriminatory kind of actions from family or friends or government or whatever it might be, that it's easy to demonize what you think is in your head. But when you look me across the table in the eyes and I tell you that my love is no different than yours, I would hope. You can't deny would, it. You can, that melts away yeah. those excuses. Now, I just had a discussion with someone yesterday with a 21-year-old that came out and it was like, pack your bag, get out. Like, pack your bag and get out of my house. And it was based in religion, righteousness, that that ugliness that that actually paints a broad brush of religion because I don't believe, and I, I came from a very religious household when I grew up, and in my household, it wasn't about the judgment as much as it was about like the morality of it. Like, how do you treat others and how do you want to be treated? Right. Mm -hmm. So it was, I love that guidance because I didn't, I, I didn't have to adhere to a certain God or certain understanding, but you hear these stories left and right where parents with their own children are unable to open their hearts and minds enough to understand that diversity within their own home is a reflection of real life and diversity in the world. Like you're willing to deny reality that is living within your home, that is your blood, that is your child, that is your family member. You're willing to deny one truth in general and their truth. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, if that were to happen and you say, come into my home and sit down and talk to me, like get to know me because I guarantee you your ideas of what this means are only ideas. And I haven't changed in the last five minutes after coming out to you. You loved me six minutes ago, you know, and now you don't five minutes later, like you have to address what that means for you. And ultimately, Sometimes family you're born with is not the family you die with because people are unwilling to at least l stop and listen. They're so willing to put fences around their world in a way that they can't open. I mean, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. Like, can you have an opportunity to grow, to understand, to stop and listen? Or do you shut that opportunity down because your ego or whatever it is in you that is wired to discriminate against someone, even in your own family, is so strong that you're unwilling to give them the benefit of the doubt or the opportunity to show you who they truly are. That to me is the most devastating part of it. And sometimes it just ends up being that way. And I often think about the parents of friends that I know. I was I officiated a wedding um, last year of a, a couple of, of my friends and one, mom was there and the other refused to go. She's like, I love you for who you are, but I can't love this action because it's a sin, basically. And did not show up. And I could see the pain during the first, you know, mom son dance type of thing. I could see and I could feel it was like palpable that he really wished his mom was there. And I think about her and parents like her putting their head to the pillow every night and thinking I've lost a son because I can't at least open up my heart and my mind to understand that what I think might be wrong. Yep. <laughs> I think, I think that's absolutely, it is devastating first and foremost. And I think that's really beautiful advice. I love come to dinner because it's so, so true. We're always so fearful of things we just don't understand. And it goes back to the beginning of our conversation with putting yourself the magic the magic that happens and the evolution that happens within a human being when they simply try something new or put themselves in an uncomfortable um, scenario that they just simply have never done or experienced before. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's what living is about. I feel like, um, but I think that's, I think that's really beautiful advice and I hope it's heard by many people who need to, to hear it right now. And um, I just want to thank you for I've always been such a big fan of yours um but it's just so clear that across the board from representing in the fitness industry and being such a welcoming kind um human being and then fighting so hard for for what you believe in that that has changed millions of people's lives I just I just want to thank you and I no. appreciate you. You're so sweet for saying that. Listen, I, I love how the world works, right? Where 
things bring people together for a reason. And regardless of time between connecting or whatever it might be, there's still connection. And that's, that's what really kind of like being alive is about to me. It's about always having those connections. So thank you for asking me to be on because that to me is a humbling even offer. <laughs> uh, makes me like, it, it makes me feel good. So I, I thank you as well. And I also believe that life is about discovery. And you just made that point. It's like, you have to go through your life, I believe. Like, it's not a prescription as much as it is the way I live, and I can still only speak for myself, is that I know my life is richer because I'm approaching it with the idea of I want to know more. I want to be a student on life until I can't be any longer, and that's the day I die. So the idea of opening my eyes, shutting up and listening speaking when I need to speak, standing proud, fighting for what you believe in, you know, working with passion about, you know, fitness and health and wellness. Um, life is about discovery. And like, why wouldn't you? And I'm going to, I'll, I'll tell you a funny quick story about a, a friend of mine in Canada uh, that I met going up there to do fitness work. So much like you and Pound, um, I created, you know, a couple programs where I would travel and do um you know, day long certifications and like club visits and like, you know, special classes and so on and so forth. And I remember my, I wasn't going to take my first trip to Canada because I had never been and I didn't really know these people all that well. And they had seen me at a conference and like, no, you're coming, you have to come. And the, and one of the gyms I visited, there were one of the gym owners, um, we were wrapping up the weekend and everyone was exhausted. And I had like a six o'clock flight home and it was probably after dinner around 10 or so. And I'm like, well, I should probably go to bed. I'll get a couple hours sleep. He goes, well, why not like just stay out? Like let's stay out and let's drink and have fun and dance and like, just have a good time and like, just like get to know each other better or whatever. And I was like, and my instinct, the Paul instinct at that time, this is years ago was no, I got to go to bed. The responsible thing is getting a few nights sleep, waking up, looking good, you know, going on the plane, blah, 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 getting home. <laughs> And he said to me, and he said it, and I don't even know what language it is, to be honest with you. I don't remember. He said, Vahomich. And I was like, what? And he was like, Vahomich. And I'm like, what does that mean? What are you saying? He goes, it means, why wouldn't you? And it was like something snapped inside of me in that moment. I went, oh my God, yeah. You know what? You're right. Why wouldn't I? So we all stayed out. We made a pact to stay out and <laughs> you know, hold each other up in the morning and get me to the airport. And it was a profoundly fun night in which we had deep and fun conversation, danced, drank. Like it was such a live your life moment that I'll never forget. And I hang on to that word because it helped guide me in the realm of kind of discovery and not to always rely on the rules and regulations that you think life is expecting from you, but to create your own. I think that's the, the lesson we've hopefully learned today is life is about discovery. That's why we, you know, we call ourselves fitness rebels, but that's what being a rebel is to me. It's about, it's almost that moment where you, you wake up and you're like, wait, why am I listening to myself? <laughs> and you, you listen to your gut and you listen to your intuition. And um, it's, it's a very powerful thing um, when you do. So Paul, can you tell everybody where they can find you on on all of the platforms, the websites, the social media, and beyond? Your address. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite foods. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, I, I am mainly living right now on Instagram, and it's just at my name, Paul Katami. Um, it's kind of where I've been pouring kind of like my heart and soul in fitness. Um, and I've been trying to kind of grow that to be kind of like my platform. Uh, Jeff and I both have a platform on Instagram as well, which is Jeff Z and Paul K. So if you're more interested in the kind of activism and personal side of things that, you know, there's a little bit more there. Um, and then my website is just paulkatami.com. I'm a simple guy. Like, it's all it is. I've actually kind of stripped away from a lot of things and focused really solely on my work in fitness and activism. Um, and that's where you can find me. So please, I also have, believe it or not, I should probably say this. My gosh, Jeff would be so mad at me for not saying it. I actually started a podcast a year ago. And um, it's kind of was a private podcast for a small group of friends. Uh, my mom passed last July uh, unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And it was a transformative experience for me spending the last days with her, last five days of her life together with her in the hospital and not leaving for five days. And 
a friend of mine who is in the podcast world, um, I had been talking to him and he said, you know, some of these things that you um, you say could be something therapeutic for you, but I think the world like, needs to hear it. And I was like, yeah, right, whatever. Is it okay to swear? <laughs> Absolutely. Sure. Okay, cool. I just want to make sure. Um, so I have a tendency to say to my close friends in a most loving type of way, get your shit together. I'm like, get your shit together. Get your shit together <laughs> all the time. And my friends laugh about it. But I... Right after my mom passed, it was a, a troubling time. It was hard. And my friend said to me, like, Paul, get your shit together. And I was like, oh. And I looked at the acronym of get your shit together, and it was GIST, G-Y-S-T. And I was like, well, the GIST means, like, the point. Like, get to the point. Like, what's the GIST of this, this situation or the conversation? So I started a podcast called The GIST, G-Y-S-T, which stands for get your shit together. And I did the very first episode at the Golden Gate Bridge where my mom had emigrated. She was super sick, like super seasick, pregnant with my sister, like about to give birth. And I asked her, what was the beacon? Like, what was the thing that you saw that gave you hope about leaving, you know, your whole life, not speaking the language, emigrating to a different company, being a foreigner, you know, taking all these risks to give us a better life? And she said it was the Golden Gate Bridge. Like, I saw that bridge. And it just gave me this idea of security and transition and, you know, et cetera. So... I sat at the Golden Gate Bridge and I recorded the first episode, uh, you know, last August, probably. And so since then, I have been doing a almost weekly podcast called Get Your Shit Together. There's 20 episodes up right now. And you can subscribe to that on iTunes or iHeartRadio or Spotify or um, Apple, Apple Podcasts or Google. Uh, if you just look up the just G-Y-S-T with Paul Tommy, that's another way you can interact with me because it has been really profound with all the people that have reached out after listening. Um, and I didn't do any promotion. Like this is the first time I've ever said anything like publicly on any other show about it because it was really meant for a group of about 50 to 100 friends that were like, I want, I want, like I need this as well. People who have lost parents or whatever it might be. And um, and now it's growing and it's growing in a, in a profound way. And I'm so grateful for it because for me, it's the thing that anchors me on a weekly basis personally but I understand that it can connect me with other people that are feeling the same way. And there's that. That's incredible. So the, the gist G Y S T. Correct. Um, make sure you guys look that up. And if you haven't watched um, the case against eight, that's another amazing documentary where you can learn more um, about Paul and his journey. Um, thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciated um, this conversation today, and I know our community is going to get so much out of it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. I'm truly, truly humbled by it, and just having this conversation with today, with you today, is setting me up for like a perfect day. So this is awesome. Aww. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Big Green Couch. Remember to subscribe to our podcast on either iTunes or Spotify and to follow us on Instagram at The Big Green Couch.